Hey guys, we'll, uh, we'll get started with Grand Rounds for this morning. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jason Roberts, uh, who's a clinical electrophysiologist here in London and has been since August of 2015. Uh, Dr. Roberts uh, did his internal medicine training in Toronto and then a cardio fellowship in Ottawa and then his EP fellowship at UCSF or University of California, San Francisco, uh, and then, uh, then moved to London here to become a clinician scientist. Uh, so we all know that means that he does a ton of research and contributes academically. Um, his interest is in genetics of cardiac arrhythmias, uh, and he's the director of the Inherited Arrhythmia Clinic at LHSC. I manage a large number of patients with long QT, Borgata, uh, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. He's, uh, from a research perspective, he's pioneered the development of the first point of care genetic test in clinical medicine with uh, Spartan Bioscience and developed diagnostic criteria for the short QT syndrome, identified the first genetic culprits of bundle branch reentrant re VT, and recently demonstrated that long QT syndrome type six is a provoked arrhythmia condition rather than a canonic, canonic I can't even pronounce it, form of long <laughs> QT syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> way beyond my <laughs> So thank you for presenting today, Jason. We look forward to your presentation. Great, thanks so much for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, yeah, a lot of this stuff is uh, somewhat esoteric, but um, as the conditions that I'm gonna talk today um, about are long QT syndrome, Borgata, and ARVC. They're all relatively rare, but you guys see them, and we get a lot of referrals from the emergency department um, for these conditions. And they're, they're important because um, they affect young people who are otherwise healthy, and um, they can be a cause, as I'm sure you guys know, of sudden cardiac death. Um, in young people, and that's always a, a catastrophe. Um, so you guys play a big role in this in terms of a lot of these patients that come in with fainting episodes, um, you're able to key in that they may have these conditions on the ECG. So, so for you guys to be aware of them, I, I, I think it's great, and I'll, I'll go through um, kind of an overview of these three conditions. There's a few other inherited arrhythmia syndromes that I'm um, not gonna touch on these things that even longer words, CPVT or catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, that's very rare. We'll leave that out today. Um, as well as short QT syndrome is also very rare. Um, I think in terms of bang for a buck over the next hour, it would be most worthwhile to go through these. So if you guys have any questions during the talk, it's meant to be interactive. Um, feel free to, to speak up um, and, uh, and um, interact and I'll have questions as well that hopefully you guys will uh, Answer. So, in terms of how I um, set this up, we're going to go through um, three cases in no particular order, um, and uh, we'll walk through kind of uh, diagnosis and, and management of them. So, case one. So, 20-year-old female, previously well, um, was running to catch a bus, and w at peak exertion, suddenly lost consciousness. Recovers within seconds and quickly returns to, to baseline, and, and feels better really quickly, and, and almost wondered, should I even go to the emergency department because I feel so well? So that kind of syncope, um, it's kind of a leading question, but should we be worried about that? Yes. Yeah, so <coughs> syncope with exertion is always abnormal. And this is one of the takeaways that I, I want you guys to, to have from this talk. I suspect you already um, know about it. It's oftentimes patients aren't that worried about it though because it's sudden onset <laughs> so they don't feel well beforehand, and it only lasts for you know, 10, 30 seconds, um, and then they feel back to, to baseline quickly. So they feel if they got back to baseline that quickly, then it must not be that serious. Whereas more benign causes of syncope, like vasovagal, <laughs> people are oftentimes much more worried about. People feel unwell beforehand, faint, look horrible and gray for minutes, and then when they come back, they feel terrible. When we hear that story, we're always <laughs> very relieved and reassured, and um, assuming their ECG looks okay, we're oftentimes happy to say, this sounds like it's vasovagal, not to worry. Um, but what worries us, <laughs> the kind of syncope that really worries us, it's with exertion. That's never normal, um, and should always kind of uh, be signaled as a red flag. So. The differential diagnosis, in, so this talk is around inherited arrhythmia conditions, so it's, it's young kids um, in particular, although older <coughs> patients can present uh, for, with, with first presentations um, with these things. But it should always be abnormal. In, in older people worry about, worry about ischemic cardiomyopathy, so um, that's the most common cause of scar in, in older people is coronary artery disease. They can get um, malignant VT with, with exertion. Um, so that should tr trigger a, a concern. Same thing with 
any cause of scar, so non ischemic cardiomyopathy. In terms of um, um, other things to, to think about, the kind of more um, weird and wonderful. Um, so we divide up malignant VT in terms of polymorphic VT and monomorphic. So polymorphic VT, it's an electrical driver of the VT. So the ventricle can look completely normal on echo and MRI, um, and the setup for it is just the electricity is abnormal. Um, so <laughs> what can happen is, uh, so, so for young patients, things like long QT, this thing called CPVT that we're not going to talk about. And the ischemia can also do this. So oftentimes ischemia, um, when, uh, when it presents, people show up with VF and it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, in young patients that can, uh, can have abnormal coronary arteries, um, there's one where the, an artery goes between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. <laughs> it's called a nutcracker um, syndrome because the idea that great vessels kind of compress against it. Um, and with exertion, that can get worse. So people can collapse um, because of polymorphic VT, um, because of ischemia. So those are things to, to think about. From a structural perspective, as mentioned, any kind of scar, <laughs> that's a setup for monomorphic VT. Those patients typically don't get um, polymorphic VT unless they have a, a, a ischemia as well. Things um, for that, ARVC, so we'll talk about that. That's the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's another uh, reason you can get scar from a genetic perspective. And as mentioned, in older people, <laughs> we'll not uh, address this as, as much today, but the most common reason to have scar in your ventricle is, is because of uh, <coughs> uh, coronary artery disease. So here's the patient's ECG. So this was a, a real case um, that was seen in the ER and was ultimately referred to our clinic. So what do you guys notice on the ECG here? What's the glaring abnormality? So it's sinus rhythm. What else is going on? Yeah, exactly. So the QTC, it should be kind of um, screaming um, at you. Um, the, the report, you know, obviously the QTC would be reported, but this QTC was up around, I think this one was uh, up around 550, 570, um, which is very, very long. Um, so something is uh, ab abnormal um, um, here. <laughs> In some patients, you can there's reversible causes of, of long QT, so it's really important to tease that out on history. If your electrolytes are a mess, your magnesium, potassium are super low, that can push the QT out. It's usually not as long as, as this in young people, but it's, it's possible. And the other thing are drugs um, <laughs> and medications. So over-the-counter stuff in some vulnerable people can, can push the QT um, out, although still usually it doesn't go out quite as this far. And then there's some heavy-duty drugs that we give, like Sotolol, um, that can sometimes push, push it out um, as well. So in terms of questions on history that you want to ask, so in someone where you, a, a young person who's otherwise well, um, who had a, a concerning episode of syncope, what kind of things do you want to know on history? In this context. Yeah. Your family history of sudden cardiac death or unexplained drownings or a single event of car accidents? Yeah, excellent, excellent. So that's always something that we key into. So all the conditions that I'm talking today, about today are, are genetic conditions, and they're supposed to be, most of them are autosomal dominant inheritance. So that means 50% of the first-degree family members likely have the condition. So where there's not, a, not everybody dies with these, <laughs> these conditions. A lot of people can make it through uh, their whole life. But oftentimes, you do a, a careful family history, you, you, you hear that, People died suddenly, or there's suspicious deaths. For example, someone was out swimming, they're a good swimmer, and just drowned one day. <laughs> or another person was, uh, was driving, everything seemed to be fine, and they had a really funny car accident at 35 and died. Um, and the presumption may have been the car accident was what killed them, but it could, it could have been that they developed torsade, for example, um, while driving the car. That resulted in the car accident, but they had already died before then. So, um, yeah, in terms of history, so, have you had prior syncopal episodes? Oftentimes they have. Um, usually they haven't had tons. So if you've had 30, 40, 50 episodes <coughs> of syncope and you just keep getting up, <laughs> that's a little funny. If, if you're having polymorphic VT or torsade repeatedly, usually after three or four times, you're gonna need to get um, defibrillated or you're, or you're gonna, gonna die. If someone has had it 50 times, we oftentimes that find that somewhat reassuring. It's not a guarantee, but They've had two or three episodes similar to this, though. That's that that that's you know potentially worrisome. 
Um, in this particular patient, they didn't have any prior sinkhole episodes. Their past medical history, they're completely well. Um, medications, they, uh, they weren't on any, so that's, that's something that we really look carefully here. She's 20, why is she presenting now? And sometimes it just takes a while. Uh, but we look for inciting episodes. Oftentimes what pushes people over with long QT, they're able to kind of tolerate the longer QT, but they get a secondary insult like a drug that prolongs the QT, and it can be as simple as something like Cipro, um, that all of a sudden they're hanging on with a QTC of 490, they get this additional um, insult. Most of the population go on Cipro and their QTC doesn't change at all, but if they're just hanging on with their cardiac repolarization, it can blow out to 540, 550, and that's when they get a bend. So we always look for kind of a, uh, an inciting trigger. No known drug allergy, they're just doing a good uh, uh, history. This person <laughs> never had a family history, and we'll get to that why um, in, in terms of their genetic testing results. Social history, they're a Western undergrad student who actually wants to go to med school. <coughs> Physical exam was normal. So in the setting of long QT, as mentioned, it's a channelopathy, it's an electrical disease. So um, we don't expect uh, there to be any uh, uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac findings. We still usually get an echo in the setting of syncope just to make sure there's nothing funny going on. There's some overlap syndromes where you can get structural disease. Um, and, uh, um, and the QT can be a little longer, um, but usually it's, everything's normal. So other, <laughs> I've alluded to this a little, so other investigations that you'd want at this point? I'm gonna help out a bit here, Morton. Investigations you want at this point? Uh, I'll get an echo. Yeah, so you can get uh, a non-urgent echo. You don't need to uh, wait the cardiology uh, follow up in the middle of the night uh, for this one. Um, but it's worthwhile documenting that they have a structurally normal heart. But in terms of typical um, kind of labs that you'd want and stuff like that, it's not a just regular stuff. Basics, electrolytes, make sure there's no significant metabolic alterations. Yeah, exactly. So you want to make sure the potassium, magnesium, calcium are, are all okay. If the potassium's 2.0 or something like that, the differential all of a sudden is, is, is different. Um, and as mentioned, medications can push, push this out. <laughs> um, Usually you're able to get that on history, and some people we still do a talk screen if, we're, if it's just really funny, especially if um, all these CGs were normal. So something that we always look for in these patients is it, if it's truly genetic long QT syndrome, usually their QTCs have been long their entire life. It can fluctuate a lot though, like sometimes we see people in, in, in clinic, their QTC is 450, <coughs> which is in the normal range. Um, but other days it could be 500, 510. Autonomic tone, it can, it can change. But if you have, they've had ECGs in the past, it's nice to, to look at that. If they've always been normal and all of a sudden they're, it's blown out, it's really good to look for a, a kind of secondary cause. Um, so regular over-the-counters can do it. Um, and then other drugs, things like methadone, can also uh, push it out. Again, you'd usually get that on history though. <coughs> good. So in terms of deciding whether or not um, a patient has long QT syndrome, um, uh, and we'll come back to our case in just a sec. This is kind of just uh, taking a step back. It's not totally cut and dry. And the, the, <laughs> the issue is there's no kind of fixed Q, or just QTC cutoff that you can use for everybody that if you're above this, you have long <coughs> QT syndrome. Um, and if you're below this, uh, you're fine. Um, Mike Ackerman is a prominent guy from the Mayo Clinic <laughs> who sees lots of long QT patients. Um, and uh, this paper was from him. And if you look at the general population, there's QTC values that go up as high as 470, 480 in, in normal people. Um, and then in long QT patients, as mentioned, they can have, there's people that can have values that are well within the normal range. So there's this overlap um, region that we kind of struggle with. Um, <laughs> um, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind. There's some tricks that we use to try to tease things out. One is genetic testing, and I'll talk about that um, in a bit. The other thing, it's not as much for you guys in the emergency department, but it's just something that, <laughs> to know that we use is oftentimes the uh, treadmill test. Um, QT, if it is, they, they do have long QT, there is QT pathophysiology, oftentimes it would be brought out with exercise. Um, so when we do a treadmill test, even on standing, there'll be hints that maybe some, someone's QT um, step is abnormal. During exercise and during re recovery period, there's things that we can look for. So that's just a, just to, to, to um, and highlight that point. There's no fixed QTC cutoff, yes? I just want to take you back to the talk screen. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, methadone. Yes. 
But what else are we looking for? Are we looking for uh, uh, arrhythmogenic drugs? Are we looking for cocaine and uh, amphetamine? Is that what we're looking for? Uh, no, no, just re so in terms of the top screen, I guess it's how broad um, that you do. So there's a long list of drugs that can prolong the QT, and I'll, I'll mention this. So, uh, there's a website called Credible Meds that's dedicated to, to this issue. Um, so uh, it l has a list of all medications that prolong the, the QT. Whenever we start a patient on a medication, or anybody that starts a, pa a patient on a medication with, uh, with long QT syndrome, um, they should go to this website and check, and, and I do because you can easily get fooled. There was a year ago, there was a new drug <laughs> that came out in cardiology called Evabradine that I thought was fine, prescribed it to a patient who also had long QT syndrome, and then I got a call from the pharmacist that uh, it can prolong the QT, and that's an embarrassing phone call. <coughs> um, but it's, um, yeah, in terms of the talk screen, it depends on what you guys are, are, uh, are, are get on, on your talk screen, but um, in terms of... And it's opiates, it's benzos, it's uh, phenobar, that means okay, well, if it's and, limited to and that. Tricyclics we can get as well as a separate test. Sure, yeah, so tricyclics are important. Those other ones, um, for the most part, I don't think they have an effect on QT, so that talk screen, sure, it's not going not gonna to give you much. Um, it depends. Like, I think there's some that are run at SickKids and uh, Dave Yearlink at Sunnybrook. Um, there's some that could just run for, you know, large uh, panel medications. Again, you'd usually get this on history. It's just something to mention. We've had some patients that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, where, where things have come up, but maybe that's not an issue. Okay, um, so yeah, so I kind of talked a bit uh, about this. This is again kind of stepping back, just giving background on this. So long QT syndrome, channelopathy, so no structural heart disease. It's usually inherited as an autosomal dominant pattern, and I'll clarify that in just uh, a minute. So prevalence of it, we think it's, it, estimates currently are about 1 in 2,000 um, people have this, and there's some <coughs> suggestion that it may be as, as high as 1 in 1,500. So it's rare, but it's not super, super uh, rare. With those numbers, you can imagine with the current Canadian population, we'd estimate that there's about 18,000 people with long QT syndrome in Canada, and most of these are actually undiagnosed. So there's a Canadian long QT registry that's, that's been started up, um, and most of the uh, centers are are participating in Canada, and enrollment's still gradually ramping up. But we only have probably about, um, I think about seven, 800 um, uh, patients enrolled, and there's still lots more that haven't been enrolled that are known, but there's a large <coughs> proportion of the patient uh, population that has this, but they don't actually know, and there's probably, people are dying in the family, and nobody really understands why. So in terms of autosomal dominant uh, inheritance, so I'm sure you guys learned about this um, in medical school. Um, so the idea is it's um, a single mutation um, that's carried by one of the parents usually um, and you have two copies of each gene in your genome um, and one copy uh, carries the mutation. So the chance of uh, the offspring inheriting this is 50%. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's the idea. Most of these are autosomal dominant. Um, some are autosomal recessive, but uh, that's, that's the exception rather than so in terms of clinical features, <coughs> so I mentioned, so fainting and, and sudden cardiac death. Um, the reason that people faint um, and die suddenly is uh, because of uh, this rhythm called torsade de point. So it's a form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. What <coughs> makes uh, torsade torsade? It's just that the QT is long. Um, so most polymorphic VT that we see is actually because of a long QT. The big exception is ischemia. Um, so ischemia, the setup beforehand, uh, the QT is usually normal, and then because of the ischemic insult, people go into polymorphic VT and then quickly into VF. Um, whenever we see polymorphic VT VF, the first thing we do is go back and look at the ECG pre, post, is the, is the QT long, and that's helpful in terms of mechanism. If the QT is not long, it's ischemia until proven otherwise, and the patient needs a cat. Um, uh, yeah, so in terms of the setup for these episodes, um, it's typically during exertion, so I can't say it enough. S syncope with exertion, uh, there's something wrong. For whatever reason, reasons we don't totally understand, swimming um, seems to be particularly arrhythmogenic for, for long QT, in particular <laughs> long QT1. I'll get to this in a, in a couple of minutes, but there are multiple different types of long QT syndrome. There's been 15 genes implicated. Each gene gets its own name. So long QT1 is one particular gene. Long QT2 is another. They all have their own unique features, but for you guys, <laughs> broad principles are probably, yeah, 
are, are, are sufficient. It's more that you guys recognize syncope with exertion, look at the ECG. If the QT is long, something's wrong and they need to, they need to see, see cardiology. So, <coughs> as mentioned, there's no um, simple cutoff for the QTC. So because of that, um, there's a composite score that's been developed uh, by a guy named Peter Schwartz in Italy. Um, so it incorporates the QTC <coughs> value, that's very important. Um, but over and above that, they, they incorporate um, additional features, including family um, uh, history, results of the treadmill test, so on and, and so on. This is just, you know, it would be nice if we just had a single cutoff that we could use, but uh, we don't, so we kind of bring these additional factors in to make the diagnosis. Um, so, in terms of management, so going back to our case, so 20-year-old female um, had a syncopal episode, um, the QTC um, looks long on the um, ECG, it's quite long. We've done a history, there's no um, reversible factors. We didn't have old ECGs on um, uh, this girl, but there's no uh, medications. Her electrolytes were all, all fine. Um, so for you guys, refer to cardiology, and that's great. Um, effectively, your job is done, but I think it's also worthwhile you have an idea of how we subsequently manage uh, these pe people because you'll see people with these diagnoses coming back to your ER. Um, so, one big question, so did this patient need an ICD? Yeah, so, um, so no. Um, <laughs> um, and it's a big, it's a big deal. Um, ICDs in young people um, are, are a huge deal because you can imagine you're getting a device when you're young, some of these people are still gonna grow and they'll outgrow the device, but over and above that, you're kind of committing them to a, a, a new disease. So ICDs aren't perfect, they break over time, um, the leads. Every time a lead breaks, we usually have to take it out. Um, the lead gets stuck in the heart, it gets stuck to the vein, so pulling um, a lead out um, is associated with the risk of death. Lead extraction, is set, especially if um, the lead's been in for 10, 15 years, the longer it's been in, the, the, the more aggressively it gets stuck, um, the more risk it, it, it is. So every time we take it out, we quote usually about a one <coughs> to two percent risk of death. So you can imagine if that's happening over a couple of times in your life, in your lifetime, that's pretty significant. The other thing is the batteries with defibrillators, they run out. Um, so every time it runs out, you have to replace it. It's a small surgery to get it um, uh, fixed. It usually only takes us about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, but uh, every time you do that and open the skin, there's a risk of infection. If the leads get infected, everything has to come out. Um, <laughs> so that's just a few things. So an ICD, we think really hard about it because over a lifetime, if you put an ICD in a, a young person, they're going to have adverse events because of it, and some of them are potentially fatal. The good news in long QT syndrome, beta blockers, so simple beta blockers, when I first learned about long QT, I was like, oh, they must have something really cool to treat this. Um, hopefully we will in five to 10 years, something that actually fixes the QT, but uh, right now, uh, beta blockers are first line, and they work incredibly well in the vast majority of, uh, of patients. Assuming they, you, they take their beta blocker at a good dose, it's usually intermediate um, to, to high, high dosing. Um, and again, that's our job to make sure they're on the right uh, dosing. Breakthrough events are extremely rare. Um, it, some people go as far as saying a beta blocker is a cure as long as people take it. Compliance is a huge issue, as you guys can imagine. <laughs> and these young people who are 15, 20, 25, they're not used to taking medications every day and they feel completely fine. So their motivation to take it um, is oftentimes not great, so people miss doses. And that's usually when people run into to, um, problems. Breakthrough events, they can happen, but oftentimes it's, it's compliance. Beta blocker of choice is not at all, and there's a few reasons, and we don't totally understand, but it seems to work the best. We still use bisoprolol because we find it's oftentimes fairly well tolerated, and most people that are low to intermediate risk, this is fine. Um, but yeah, the, a big thing to take away from is long QT syndrome, treatment of choice, beta blockers. We only go to ICDs if we're running into big problems, and, and that's very rare these days. The other huge thing that we counsel patients on, as mentioned, is avoidance of QT prolonging drugs. That's when they usually get into to trouble. So if they're taking a beta blocker, they're usually protected, but they run into problems when someone prescribes them a, um, a, an, an, an antibiotic, like a fluoroquinolone or um, 
a, uh, a macrolide. Um, the other psych meds can sometimes do it, but then we're usually okay. The psychiatrists recognize this is an issue and usually ask us beforehand, and we weigh, weigh the, the risks and benefits. Antiemetics can also be a, a big um, thing. Things like ondansetron can, can push it out, the QT out. There's a long list of these things, and I can't remember all of them, and not even close, um, so I always look, look it up. Um, and we recommend to these, these patients, whenever a, pa a, a, a doctor starts on the medication, they have to ask the doctor to look it up. Um, then the pharmacists <laughs> always invariably know about this, so they look it up as well, and that's oftentimes when these things are, are caught. Um, and then we also put it in the hands of the patient. They, uh, we, we spend a lot of times educating these patients. They're in charge and responsible for their disease as well, so that's an additional screen. So those three screens are usually enough. Again, sometimes for someone like me who prescribes them the, uh, the wrong medication, and that's just an example, it can, it can happen to anyone. I'm supposed to be the one guy that, that is nev this never happens to, but it still does. Um, in terms of exercise and long QT syndrome, so as mentioned, so the highest risk of events we think is with exertion. Um, so when these conditions were initially um, first described and, and people started to appreciate how patients behaved, the, the approach was to just completely exercise restrict uh, people. The only sports that these people were supposed to be able to play, let's see if we get the arrow to come up here, is the um, bottom uh, left corner. So billiards, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, and riflery. Which, and it's kind of funny, the people that play cr cricket or like cricket are really mad that uh, their sports in the bottom half <laughs> with these. But, uh, um, but yeah, but you can imagine for a lot of people that's devastating. We have a lot of competitive athletes, people that want to make the NHL, at this, um, but over and over and above that, people that just sports is their lifestyle. So to tell a 15 or 16 year old kid you can't play sports anymore, or a 78 year old kid, that's a massive deal. And, and um, because of that, there were um, uh, patients that said, you know what, I understand that, that, that I have this, but I'm going to continue to, to exercise as long as I, I take my beta blocker and, and, and see what happens. And carefully, when patients were carefully monitored and, and managed, they've, they've done really well. So this guy, Michael Ackerman at the Mayo Clinic, has really been a pioneer for this, and he's kind of gradually, while the rest of the world was exercise restricting patients, he's gradually let people exercise. And he's found that as long as they're on the beta blocker, they do great. Um, so in his practice, um, he's followed probably more long QT patients than anyone. He's only had one event in 331 athlete years. So it's, it's, as long as they're managed properly, people can do very well. Um, that said, the risk isn't zero, and we encourage kind of a shared decision-making plan. There are some people, there are, are, are um, some patients who are like, you know what, I like sports, competitive sports, but I don't need to play them, so I'm going to step back and, and, and um, uh, kind of do more recreational. Um, approach and, and, and that's fine and, and uh, we certainly support that. There are some patients who say, you know, this is really my life and it's really important to me. And we tell them the risk isn't zero. You know, the, the risk of an event is probably less than 1% per year, uh, but it's not zero. Assuming you're willing to take on that risk, it's okay and we will do everything we can to, to minimize your risk. Over and above medications, um, again, we usually don't go to, to, to defibrillators in these, these patients. Um, we recommend that uh, they also get an AED. Um, so any kids that are playing competitive sports with their hockey bag and the rest of their equipment, part of their equipment is also an AED that they bring, bring to sports uh, events. And uh, we let their coaches, <coughs> we send letters to their coaches um, and people that are involved. So if something does happen, again, the chance of a breakthrough event is incredibly unlikely, but it's not okay for a 15-year-old kid to die. Um, in the event that something does happen, there is a device uh, available to save them. But as mentioned, the event rates seem very low. And we have a, a, a lot of um, young people that, that do um, play sports and, and um, they're all doing well. Knock on wood, I have not had any problems. It, it seems more and more, you know, this is, this is the paradigm. There's a paper in circulation, one of our big cardiology journals, talking about this just a couple of months ago, and there's more to come this year as well. Is this a complete uh, beta blockade, or is this just something that affects the electrical system? It's just regular beta blockers. So in terms of how the beta blockers work for long QT syndrome, it's, it's, we think it's more adrenaline. So in terms of uh, it, their peak uh, risk of events, 
um, it's kind of really high adrenaline state. So beta blockers just temper it. So instead of your adrenaline going up this high, it goes this high, and that seems to be enough. It doesn't. So it, the beta blockers do affect their heart rate. It, it's through that. So adrenaline affects kind of adrenaline stuff. So heart rate is one of those things. So in terms of determining if we have patients on enough beta blockers, when we bring them back, we do treadmill tests and try to get them to maximal exertion. That's a Bruce protocol is oftentimes not, not enough for um, a lot of competitive athletes. Um, but we'd like to try to make sure their heart rate's not going above 150, 160. So that's part of it. Heart rate's part of it. So that may limit some, some athletes. Yeah, so that's definitely um, uh, an issue. Some, and that's when people can get into to trouble. Um, is that big games um, when they really want to play their best, they feel beta blockers limit them to some extent, so they skip their dosing. Um, that said, for the most part, we don't have it. So patients understand the stakes here, um, and a lot of, especially kids that get on these medications, they notice the first month or two they're not quite what they used to be. But by month three, four, they don't notice that they're on it anymore. Um, they, they, they it's just, yeah, I take this medication, but uh, this is just who I am. So we haven't had a big problem with that. There are some, uh, some people that have. There's another option, something called left cardiac sympathetic denervectomy, <laughs> a denervation. I'm not going to talk about that much, where we cut the nerves um, to the heart. And that can sometimes help patients get off beta blockers, but that's a more advanced topic, and it's not as, uh, the evidence is not quite as there. Uh, strong, but for you guys, beta blockers, not ICDs. Yes? When you say event rate, is that mortality? Is that just a, a dysrhythmic event that uh, recovers? Is it syncope? What is the event? Yeah, so it's, it's a, a life threatening event. So s cardiac syncope or um, cardiac arrest. Um, so that's, you know, as mentioned, it's potentially a big deal. In this um, <laughs> case series from Mayo Clinic, the one event um, was in a patient that had. Um, a defibrillator, so they were shocked um, when they were uh, playing. Sorry, that's my Siri turning on. Um, so yeah, this, this, the stakes are, are high, but it, it seems like the you know the risk is very low. But the other thing to uh, kind of remember is sports are they're probably the highest risk events, but things can happen outside of sports as well. And how much do you disqualify people? The kid that had um, a an event playing hockey. He also had an event at a carnival, <laughs> apparently, when a, uh, someone tried to steal his cotton candy. Um, he had a defibrillator <laughs> shock. So the question is, do you also disqualify these people from carnivals? Um, and other people have events just brushing their teeth. You say you can't brush your teeth anymore. The event rate overall, when, when with sports, it seems like when people are on medication, it's very low. Um, but again, it's not zero, and it's something that you discuss with, with the patient and the family. Um, and, it, and as mentioned, there are some people that say, you know what, I'm done with competitive sports, and other people um, say, no, it's kind of it's an individualized decision, and I think that's right. It's not right for doctors to just write letters and say, this person can't play sports anymore, they're disqualified. I think it's, it, it really depends <coughs> on the patient and their values. And that as, you know, granted, if the event rates were 50%, for sure, we'd have to disqualify everybody, but they're so low um, that, that it seems reasonable for them. Okay, so we'll run through this quickly. Um, there, so the, these conditions, they're all relatively new. Um, there's been the three main genes for long QT syndrome. Two of them code potassium channel genes, and another one is uh, a sodium channel gene. <coughs> the two big potassium channel genes, this is for long QT1 and 2, or KCNQ1 and KCNH2. What happens is the channels basically break. With cardiac repolarization, potassium generally flows out of the cell. Um, the potassium channel, there's a mutation that, that occurs. Potassium doesn't flow out of the cell as well, and what we call the action potential prolongs, um, and that results in uh, uh, QT prolongation on the ECG and this risk for tor torsi. <laughs> so there's multiple genes implicated. There's actually 15 now, but um, the main, the vast majority, 85 uh, to 90% are these, the, these first three genes. Um, so, yep. So in terms of the value of genetic testing for us, um, when long QT syndrome is diagnosed in a patient, um, all first degree relatives, we take it upon ourselves to push for all first degree relatives to get screened. So it's a familial disease. We treat the patient, but we also want to treat the family. Um, so the benefits of genetics, you find a mutation, it's easy to screen the family. Everybody gets a blood test, the results are sent off, you get the result back uh, usually after about two to three months. Um, 
and, uh, and that's it. You carry the mutation, you have uh, long QT, you don't, you're off the hook. Um, uh, so that's one of the big values. The other thing, we, we try not to push this, but genetic testing, it does help diagnostic clarity. As mentioned, there's a lot of borderline cases. If a mutation comes back positive, you're kind of like, okay, this makes sense. We do have a lot of patients that are genotype negative, where their QTs are kind of borderline, and we don't know for sure. Are these people more just upper limit of normal versus, versus long QT? And that's a discussion in itself. Oftentimes, patients where we're not, not certain they could go on beta blockers just as protection, but the genetic testing can be helpful in that regard. So coming back to our case, our patient came back for a, um, a, with a mutation in the KCNH2 gene, so long QT2, known to be pathogenic, so that was fine. In terms of why she had no family history, we screened her parents and neither of them had a mutation. Um, so it turned out it was de novo. That's an exception rather the rule, than the rule, but it developed presumably during um, embryogenesis. The other thing showing here is that uh, when you screen multiple genes, you also get lots of variants of unknown significance. Um, which can also be um, uh, complicated in terms of how to, to interpret. Um, I'll just mention that that's the problem with genome and exome sequencing. You get lots of stuff back that you don't know what to do with. Anyway, so we started this um, girl on um, Natalol 120. She's resumed all of her um, daily activities. She jogs and she's gotten back into jogging and, and everything's been fine. And she finds that she doesn't really notice that she's on the medication. Um, as mentioned, so we did cascade screening. Neither of her parents carried it. She's the only one in the family that does. So that made those things relatively easy, and she's doing well. She's planning to write the MCAT this year, and she's learning about lots about long QT syndrome for her own, uh, for her own benefit. Okay, so that's long QT. We'll switch over now to, to Brugada. We'll go through this a little more um, quickly. So um, um, a patient's wife wakes up um, to find her husband, um, who was previously well and on no medications, unresponsive in bed next to her. Um, she um, uh, starts CPR, and paramedics arrive and find the patient in ventricular fibrillation. Um, uh, he gets defibrillated, and subsequent uh, ECG shows this. So I kind of introduced this, uh, I already mentioned already, but so this is a type 1 Brugada <coughs> ECG. Um, so it's good for you guys to um, recognize this pattern. So it's in V1. So none of the other leads really um, show it here. It's all in V1. So this is type 1 or coved. Um, this ECG pattern, it looks kind of like a right bundle, but it's kind of not. Um, just the way that the ST segment um, sags up and comes down in this kind of cove pattern, it's abnormal. Um, so when people that come in with syncope or certainly uh, uh, cardiac arrest, if, if you see this on an ECG, that's a big red flag. So in terms of uh, background, so Brugada syndrome was only uh, reported in, uh, first reported in 1992. It was probably reported in 1989. There's a guy, Bortolo Martini, who every time you publish a paper on Brugada, he emails you and asks you, did you cite my paper? I'm the guy that actually described this, and it should be called after me. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, the Brugada brothers get, are the ones that uh, generally get the credit for, for reporting it. So Brugada ECG pattern, so type 1 pattern, that is the problematic <coughs> pattern. Type 2 and type 3 are non-specific. They're not uncommon in the general population, um, and they seem to be, in the vast majority of cases, benign. So we really worry about overdiagnosis um, uh, in these patients. We're really careful um, uh, about, about that. We honestly don't know what to do in, in patients that have, who are asymptomatic, who have type 2 or type 3 patterns. Um, if you guys refer to us, we do a drug challenge. We're also worried about the specificity of drug challenge. Um, we use a drug in North America called procainamide, and it seems to be positive in about 2 to 3 percent of the population. And that's way more than, than the number that actually has Brugada, we think. So the definitions are kind of unclear. It's a much bigger issue in Europe where they use a drug called Ajmaline, where estimates are now suggesting it's positive in like 15 to 20 percent of the population, which is crazy. It's not specific a enough at all. The issues with this is, as you can imagine, someone gets a test like this and they're told, oh, you have Brugada syndrome. They go home and read on the internet, oh, I have Brugada syndrome and I guess I'm going to die soon. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's terrible. And um, so we're, we're very careful. I'm going to talk about overall, even a type 1 pattern, the 
outcome is usually very benign. Event rates are extremely low in asymptomatic patients. And because of that, our approach is observation. Um, if you, but so, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a, uh, a bit, but so the spontaneous pattern, the drug-induced pattern, um, event rates are, yeah, they're, they're very, very low. And we really worry about labeling people with, uh, with, with these di diagnoses. Um, so as I mentioned, so type 1 ECG pattern, that's the one that you worry about. That definitely needs to get referred to us. And the type 2 and type 3 pattern, if someone has symptoms, worrisome symptoms, yes? Does the ECG ever change within that patient? If it was a type 2, all the ECG ever change? Yes, absolutely. So type 1 pattern can be transient. So it can, it, it can show up one day, and then you see them in clinic a month later, and it's not there anymore. So that's, yes? And uh, your light's on. Um, I don't know how it, all right, I'll just turn it over like this. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so it, it can be, it can be transient. That's also, if, so if someone has worrisome symptoms with a type 2 pattern, we definitely do a drug, drug challenge or type 3 pattern. If they're asymptomatic, 3% of the population has this, so we're not totally sure what to do. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. Um, in terms of clinical features of, of Brugada, so as mentioned, so syncope and sudden cardiac death. Unlike long QT, the setup for syncope in Brugada is usually not exertion. It's usually at periods of high uh, parasympathetic tone. So in particular during sleep um, is when these people often um, present. In Asia, where this is a little more common, there's all these terms for, uh, for this condition before it's actually appreciated what it was, and, and people would worry about going to sleep, and their family members going to sleep, worried that God was going to come and get them. Um, uh, yeah, so, so sleep's a big thing. High bail tone, so also after big meals, you've had a big meal, your stomach is stretched, high parasympathetics, that also seems to be uh, uh, a period. And the other thing is post-exertional period. So someone runs a marathon with Brugada, the risk isn't during the marathon, it's after when they're, uh, when they're uh, in the recovery period. <coughs> So back to our case, so the patient was defibrillated um, and brought to the ER. In the ER, they have recurrent VF episodes. This is somewhat um, of a specialized question, but do you, what would you give? So someone's in the ER, they have, you've recognized the ECG is Brugada. What, uh, what would you give um, uh, as a drug to try to prevent recurrent episodes? So it's, it's, some, um, so it's actually isoproteranol. So high vagal tone is uh, high risk. Beta blockers we actually think are harmful in the setting of Brugada syndrome. Um, Isoproteranol is a beta one agonist. It jacks up your adrenaline uh, uh, or sympathetic tone and it seems to suppress episodes. Again, 99.9% .9 of arrhythmias you want to give a beta blocker, but Brugada is the, the exception acutely. Um, so, vision goes on isoproteranol, does well, gets extubated. Um, EP recommends an ICD, of course, after someone's had an arrest, that's the standard. Things to mention, so I mentioned, uh, I'll go through this quickly, but there's transvenous ICDs, there's now subcutaneous ICDs. So the Achilles heel is the ICD is the lead, it tends to break over time. Um, and it's also whenever someone gets a blood infection, it's possible for the lead to get infected and everything has to come out. There's this new, um, type of ICD that's subcutaneous, so nothing is intravascular. Um, there's a generator that's put outside and then uh, an array that's um, slid uh, up around the heart, and it, sh it can shock. Um, and we oftentimes prefer that now in, in younger patients when they do need defibrillators. So it's becoming a go-to to some extent in, in Brugada. Um, the one downside of a subcutaneous ICD is it can't pace. You need to have a lead in the heart to be able to pace. So that's an issue in people that have structural heart disease <laughs> where we want to deliver something called ATP that works for monomorphic VT. Um, we can't, you can't do that with a sub-Q ICD, but that's not as much of an issue for you guys. So, patient's discharged home, he actually gets an SICD. Um, does he need to go home on medications? Do we standardly put people up with Brigada on medications? <laughs> yeah, so again, kind of a more esoteric question, but usually not. So defibrillator goes in, and, uh, and uh, they go home um, off, uh, off medications. Um, the, only, the medication that works well in Brugada, so it's not beta blockers, it's quinidine. Um, so it, it, we usually don't use quinidine empirically because oftentimes the event rates are very low in Brugada. So people have one event and then never have an event again. They're protected with their defibrillator, but 
you know, um, but don't need to take a, a, a drug every day. Quinidine, it's overall, it's generally pretty well tolerated, but it does have some side effects. Um, but if, you, if your patient is getting recurrent shocks, the go-to is, is quinidine. It's not beta blockers. A bit of an issue, quinidine is super rare, um, or the use of quinidine is super rare, so it's hard to get now. There's only a couple pharmacies in Canada where it's actually available. That's better than a few years ago. Um, this is a paper, an international paper. The opening sentence was actually from Sammy Viscan quoted a cardiology fellow from Canada that had emailed him and said, I have this patient with recurrent shocks with Brugada. I can't get quinidine. What do I, what do, I do? Um, so there's been a plea from experts to try to, to get uh, more access to this medication. Another thing that's coming on is uh, ablation for Brugada. So we think the pathology for Brugada is localized to the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, and uh, we're able to, um, when we ablate this area, so burn this, this right ventricular outflow tract, the Brugada pattern, the ECG pattern actually goes away. So this is being pushed by some aggressive people as a potential cure for the condition. It's too early. The, uh, um, this, this approach was only first described in 2011, and there's no long-term follow-up, and the, the numbers that have actually been done in the world are still low, but it's interesting. Epi it's an epicardial <coughs> ablation, so that's when we go uh, access the heart from the outside. It's like a pericardial tap, but there's no fluid. So you have to be very careful not to puncture the heart. You want, your needle goes past the pericardial sac into the space, and then you slide a wire to get into the pericardial uh, space. Um, so it's not, it's not a trivial um, procedure to do, um, but as the world's getting more and more experienced, this may become more common. We have not done an ablation for this um, in London yet, and I don't think there's been any done in, in Canada, but in Europe and the US, they're, they're being done. In terms of genes for Brigada, you guys don't need to worry as much uh, uh, about this stuff. Again, this is our job, just to know the, the main gene with Brigada is this gene called SCN5A. It's a sodium channel um, gene, um, and uh, that seems to be important for uh, Brigada pathology. Um, I'm not going to um, focus on this too much just because uh, time is getting sh uh, short and it's actually very controversial but it seems like reduced sodium channel current predisposes to, to uh, uh, Brugada. <coughs> so there's a list of genes with Brugada. The only one that we know for sure is real is SCN5A. <laughs> In terms of there's a big push to, you, uh, to publish, as you guys know, in <coughs> academia. People are always trying to publish new genes and things eventually get through in, in lower impact journals. And all of these have been public, uh, suggested to be uh, causes of Brugada, but they may not be. And it's a problem because you, people are getting tested, families are getting tested, finding a variant that we don't understand in one of these genes, and people in places that don't have a, a lot of experience say, oh, this must be the cause of your Brugada. And then they test family members and say, well, even though your ECG doesn't show Brugada, you have the gene for it, and everybody gets defibrillators, and it's a disaster. Um, so that's just an example of the potential harm from genetic testing. So, question. Yes? Um, is there anybody in town with a subcutaneous yeah, yes. Is there anything we need to know about those? Uh, if there's an issue, you just call EP. <laughs> um, there, we've implanted, I'd say, probably about 15 to 20, so not a lot. Um, there's a special interrogator for it, but you guys don't need to, to worry too much about that. No, like if someone gets a, a shock um, from it, you just call EP and we'll come and, uh, come and interrogate it. Do they um, the storm issue? Uh, no, so in terms of like uh, the ICD breaking and then getting inappropriate shocks because of it, there haven't been issues for that um, uh, so far. That's not to say there won't be in the, the future because these are relatively new devices. But no, there's no uh, recalls or anything like that. Things right now are okay. With and are they sitting in the lower chest? Yeah, so the, the can, it's somewhat bulky. People don't like it when they lie on their left side. But um, yeah, the, the can sits here. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just an array that goes up, up here. And if you need to shock someone like that, would it be a place for Yeah, just regular stuff. Don't put it right over the can, but yeah, the, um, you, could, you could, for VF, you could still put it like this. It would be fine. Um, you just let us know after. We should interrogate it after. We just we don't have a ton of experience with these in terms of people getting external shocks, but um, it's been done before, and it's, it's always been fine. With ICDs, transvenous, it's always fine after shocks. Um, but uh, we still usually uh, check. You could do AP, but this way should be fine. Just don't have the pad directly over it. But they shouldn't need shots if they've got the CPU. Uh, and it's a very sub-selected sub group that we're putting these in. It's usually young people with channelopathies. Um, that, and their only rhythm that they get is polymorphic VT or VF. So switching over, and we won't <coughs> talk about ARBC today just uh, for the purposes of, of, of time. I think it was worthwhile spending a little more time with Lonky T and Brigada. So, um, 
So the brother of case two, so this gets along with the prognosis of, uh, of Brigada um, ECGs. So his brother is 38, otherwise well, no medications. He's had three episodes of syncope, but I'll just say they're, they're not that worrisome to us. They sounded like a vagal episode. The one thing, as I mentioned, so unlike with long QT, where it's usually the setup is with high adrenaline or exertion, um, in Brugada, it's high parasympathetic tone. So vagal episodes still make us worry a little. It's the setup for these, these events. In some patients where we're worried, we put in these little implantable loop recorders. They're little chips about the size of a pinky that we can put under their, their skin to watch. But anyways, we'll say for now, he's essentially asymptomatic. We don't think he's had any cardiac syncope. 12 ECG, 12 lead ECG shows this, so it looks completely normal. In all of the, all first degree family members um, with Brigada syndrome, we always do drug challenges. Um, so he had a, a drug challenge, and it looks the same as his brother, it's actually the same ECG. But, um, uh, so we actually, we bring out the Brigada pattern though. So does he need an ICD? So he has a drug induced type one pattern and his brother had sudden death. Does he need an ICD? So, no, um, but it's, it, it, so his event rate, and I'll talk about this, is extremely low. And when Brigada was first initially described, everybody got defibrillators. And as people followed patients, they realized the vast majority of people with Brigada, event rates were incredibly low. And the harm from putting devices in everybody dramatically outweighed the benefits. There was actually a mortality difference in people that were, it, it, uh, they were actually causing increased mortality with the, the, the devices. Because overall, Brugada, it's relatively, it's relatively benign in most cases. That said, when a family member uh, has an aborted cardiac arrest or dies, there's a massive emotional component. Um, so again, you treat all patients differently. And there's some people that, that say, I have kids, my brother just died or almost died because of this, I have this on my ECG, I can't live without a defibrillator. And in those cases, we <coughs> consider it, um, um, but their in general event rates are, are super low. Family history of sudden cardiac death in Brigada and in all inherited arrhythmia syndromes except hypertrophic cardiomyopathy don't predict increased risk. So except for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we don't use uh, family history of sudden cardiac death to, to guide us. Question? Yes. Okay. In these guys, if they haven't run a VT or BF, would any of them be contraindicated? Amio, we don't have any good data that it works very well. So quinidine works great. The problem is it's difficult to get. If you guys are seeing them in the ER, give isoproteranol. You want to call EP. Um, uh, not even cardiology. You want to call EP for these. And VT storm in the setting of Brigada is very rare. There's only been a handful of case, uh, case reports <coughs> in the world. Um, so it's rare. But Amio is usually not a go-to. You can do it. Probably, you know, we give amio for everything, but it's not kind of the go-to. It would be isoproteranol and then chronically quinidine. Because the procainamide was provocative though, right? Procainamide is provocative. So quinidine works. It's not through sodium channel blockade. It's through, we think it's through its effect on this other current. Um, but yeah, typical sodium channel blockers like procainamide, flecainide, um, propafenone, we think are bad. Quinidine is safe though. It, it's, it's perfect. It just sucks everything off. So if they Yep. Yes, and call us. Do they wear a medical alert? Uh, so it varies. Um, some patients do. So people worry about labeling. And you can imagine as well with patients that um, have a Brigada pattern in isolation and they're probably never going to have problems carrying around a, a medical alert bracelet um, is not, uh, they, they don't want to be labeled. We, we don't, it's not mandated. Some patients will, but not, not, not necessarily. I, I wondered why you Well, it's kind of, it's how aggressively do you treat? So you can go the whole way and put in a defibrillator, which is most aggressive, or there's also lifestyle modifications. Um, so what we, so in terms of Brigada, the setup, so long QT, QT prolonging drugs are, are the triggers. In Brigada, fever um, can bring out the Brigada pattern. So there's the risks are if you have it spontaneously, the ECG, if you get it with fever, or if you get it with drugs. Um, 
it's kind of graded. So fever incites it. So we recommend all these patients to treat fevers aggressively. Whatever's causing their infection, they've got to get rid of it and treat their fever aggressively with Tylenol. And over and above that, they have to avoid drugs that can exacerbate the Brugada syndrome. So just like long QT, um, there is a, a, a website called brugadadrugs.org, um, which the list isn't as long, um, but there's some drugs that, uh, that, that uh, can affect it. So we advocate lifestyle modifications. Um, and then if they do have an episode of fainting, they have to see us um, after. So it's kind of a, a more, you know, there's different levels. You can go all out and put an ICD, which we don't think is good in most patients, but there's this kind of intermediate um, thing, education. So as mentioned, so type one ECG, um, if you have symptoms, syncope or sudden cardiac death, you get an ICD. If not, the standard right now is observation. That's what the guidelines recommend. And it's because event rates are so low. So in asymptomatic patients, spontaneous type 1 ECG, it's about 1% per year. If you go down to drug-induced, it's 0.3% per year. And if you compare that to the event rate in the general population of 0.1% per year, it's not a whole lot different. So you know, we obviously don't want to put defibrillators in, in, in everybody. Um, there's a series of, uh, of risk factors. So in, in the future, hopefully, we'll have a better way to further refine, because we don't want anyone to die. You can imagine if you see the event rate is 0.5% per year, and you see 200 patients in your clinic, some will die over the next couple of years, which is also not okay. But we, we know that putting defibrillators in everybody is also bad. So we're working hard on trying to figure out how to better refine these, and there's a few things that are being worked on. And as mentioned, then the type two, type three pattern is a whole other um, kind of uh, 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 issue. If it, you see that in isolation, it's probably completely um, benign in terms of do we screen everybody with a drug challenge there in the absence of symptoms, absence of family history. Um, we really don't know, and it's, we're kind of learning this as we go along. So I'm going to stop there. I'm out of time, but hopefully that's a good kind of discussion about long QT and, uh, and Brugada. We'll talk about ARBC at, uh, at another time maybe, um, but I think it was good not to cut these other things short. Questions? Yes. What would you like done with regard to referral process for the asymptomatic type two? You want to see those as an inpatient? You want to see those? Yeah, we definitely don't need to see them as an inpatient. So if it's, uh, I don't even know if we should be seeing them as, a, as referrals. Uh, in, in terms of, it's present in 0.5 to 3 percent of the population. Do you know what I mean? So I, I'm still struggling in terms of do we do, do drug challenges in all of these people, um, and then. You know, then they walk away with the label with with of, of Brugada syndrome, and I, I, I don't know. The, the, Sammy Viskin, who I mentioned, he has a type two pattern on his ECG. He's a world expert in Brugada. Um, he's asymptomatic. He's never had a drug challenge. He's just like I'm asymptomatic. It wouldn't change uh, uh, anything. So for for you guys, I think it's fine to recognize it, and it's it's you can refer. I don't know what to do, so just refer. It's but it's non urgent, and don't tell the patient they have Brugada syndrome. You just have an ECG variant on your ECG, and we're just going to refer you to a specialist to further look into it. An issue, like if you tell a patient that they have Brugada syndrome, you can imagine it has huge repercussions. There's a patient that I saw who had a type 2 pattern. Drug challenge was negative. I reassured him. I said, everything is, is fine. You don't need to worry about anything. I said, still avoid drugs. Um, the, these drugs, so let doctors know not to start these, but you don't have it. He saw a family physician a month later who said, you have the Brugada syndrome. You're going to die. You should get your will in order, um, and uh, you know, let all your family members, you know, know. So we, we broke to see him like three weeks later. I was like, "Why are you back?" And he was like, "Well, I, I I'm going to die, and I just wanted to know, you know, what 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 I should be doing." So you can just imagine there's huge psychological repercussions to this, um, and that's in a type two pattern. Even if he had a drug challenge that was positive, his event rate is you know, 0.3 versus 0.1% in the general population. It's not zero, but it's very, very, overall very benign. And as long as we follow these people, treat, tell them about fever, tell them avoid about drugs, and if they do have worse and fainting episodes, see us back, people do incredibly well. But it's, you can imagine labeling someone with this when they're 19, can be a huge deal. They're disqualified from, from insurance, and everything they sign up for, it's kind of, oh, you have this, potentially fatal condition that's terrible you know what I mean but I so yeah so I, I think I, I asked before I gave this talk a bunch of people in Canada and the US what they're what to tell you guys about the type 2 patterns and no one 
has a good answer. So I think if you guys see it, refer and, and we'll deal with it. We're still learning, but don't tell them that they have Brugada syndrome. Just say it's, a, it's an ECG pattern, um, but we're not sure. It's certainly an asymptomatic. And someone that has worrisome <coughs> fainting, then for sure that patient needs to come to us to have a, to have a drug challenge. Um, but in asymptomatic people, in, in the vast, vast majority of people, it's, it's a benign finding. Anything else? Yes? What, uh, what role should uh, high knee placement play in our workup in the emerge terms of Brugada? Yeah, so that's a great point, and I, I didn't uh, mention that because that's usually for us, but that's a great point. So in terms of Brugada, uh, the ECG pattern, um, the disease is located in the RVOT. <coughs> So the precordial leads V1 and V2, if you move them up to intercostal space, they're better focused over the RVOT, so that can bring it out. So we, our standard is to do ECG, modified high lead ECG in our clinics. We do more than just bring V1 and V2 up, but for you guys, if you do that, that's fine. Um, uh, and, and we do a drug challenge, so you can definitely do that. We don't. Um, so, you know, that shouldn't necessarily be an expectation, but if you think about that, that's, that's totally reasonable. Yeah, and if you see the type 1 pattern there, then that obviously needs to be referred. So, uh, that's a great point. Thank you very much. Great. Coming, yeah, and sorry I didn't get to talk about ARVC. It's, I, I think I wanted to do, I had it in this, the talk, but um, I think to do justice to both Long QT and Brugada, it was good to talk about these two. And if you want to hear about ARVC at some point, I'll, uh, you can bring me back or I'll send you the slide or something. Great. Anyways, thanks so much for coming. Usually the crowds for these kind of talks is like five people. <laughs> <laughs>